next on AM560, The Answer. Now, from the Signature Bank Studios. Only the biggest stories, only the biggest guests, and only the biggest opinions. This is AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. Uh, yesterday we talked about uh, Bill Ackman's comments on CNBC, the uh, billionaire financier Bill Ackman, who is a Democrat who has uh, crossed over to support Trump and been pretty outspoken about it and laid out his case for his support. But the way he described uh, thinking about the race, too, was teams, the Trump team and the Kamala team. Uh, you know, with Trump, his selection of J.D. Vance, who came from nothing to Yale Law and venture capitalist, and he's a smart guy. And on the other side, you've got Tim Wallace, who's a self-identifying knucklehead, um, who I think Bill Ackman said, who um, nobody, did he say nobody to take him seriously as president? Yeah. Yeah, I think he said something yeah, to that did. effect. No one would take him seriously if he were to become president. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, and on down the line. So other team members uh, on Kamala's team, one of them is her climate engagement director. Oh, I lo- you know, I applied for that position. I haven't heard back yet. Kamala Thorndike is her name. She's the one who uh, made things more complicated for Kamala this week when she told Politico that uh, Kamala is not for banning fracking, but she's also not for promoting the expansion of oil and gas. Right. So voters who care about climate change understand that she is someone that not only movements can work with, but she is championing these causes and that we know who she is. There's the wink and a nod to the eco-supremacists. Well, then the press reports those comments, and now she's got to backtrack. Oh, she is? She much backtrack. like, much like, you know, the candidate she works for. I didn't explain myself clearly. Uh The VP has not banned fracking, doesn't support banning fracking, and in fact cast the tie-breaking vote on the biggest pro-climate law ever, which, yes, opened new fracking leases. People know that's her position. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, They know nothing because this is a campaign of subterfuge with uh, a team practiced in the dark art. A little bit about uh, Thorndike. She was a legislative assistant to Bernie Sanders. Of course. She was a policy director for Rewiring America. The position of Rewiring America to electrify everything, you'll need to replace any machine that currently f- uh, burns fossil fuels, your gas powered car, furnace, water heater, kitchen stove, and dryer. Right. That's the, that's the program here. And then soon timed showers, right? Yeah. Um, so maybe with uh, climate engagement directors like Camilla Thorndike, maybe that helps explain why Kamala has stopped talking about that alleged existential threat called climate change. This is the subject of a recent piece from our friend Bjorn Lumberg, president of the Copenhagen Consensus Think Tank and author of Best Things First, who joins us now. Bjorn, thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. Hey, Dan. Hey, Amy. Great to be here. Um, so um, how do you uh, explain Kamala's uh, recent silence on the existential threat? We have uh, six years left on this planet, climate change. <laughs> well, that's exactly right, Dan. She doesn't talk about climate because fundamentally the climate policies that are on sale and certainly the ones that Biden and, and Harris have been uh, promoting are essentially incredibly costly ways of doing very little. Uh, We know the Inflation Reduction Act uh, would cost at least $369 billion over 10 years, but it's much more likely that over the next two, three, four decades, it'll cost uh, more than $3 trillion, and yet it will cut uh, temperatures by the end of the uh, century by much less than 0.03 degree Fahrenheit. Fundamentally, We're going to be paying a lot of money and get almost nothing for it. Very clearly, you're not going to be advocating that. You're not going to be saying we should do more of that sort of thing. That doesn't work in a democracy. And that's, of course, why Harris and Trump, for that matter, is silent on it. But really what that tells you is this is a really bad deal and we need to find smarter ways to fix climate. Yeah. And I mean, this is it's one of the the 
sort of the, the ways they sell these policies. It's a grandiose vision about saving the planet. Mm. Pay no attention to the details. And uh, <laughs> when, when we get in, then we'll do the details quietly, mainly through administrative agencies. And all of a sudden you wake up one morning and, um, you know, uh, your toilet uh, uh, tank is shrinking and your stove has to go and your, and so on and so forth. Mm. And, and, and perhaps it's worth you know, looking at the EU, which, of course, has gone much further, the European Union. Uh, and, and, and basically what we've seen over the last uh, uh, a little more than 20 years, uh, electricity prices have gone up uh, much more than 50 percent. Uh, you know, we're just paying a lot more money. Arguably, we're paying somewhere between uh, 300 and 400 dollars each person in the European Union more for electricity because of our climate policies. That's a bad deal. I mean, yes, if we were then saving the world, maybe it'd be worth it. But that's not what we're talking about. Again, the EU will do a minuscule part of the reduction in the world. So we're essentially paying a lot of money for very little benefit. And of course, that in the long run turns people off that sort of policy. Well, and what about nuclear, uh, too? I mean, because they, they generally take a positive. These same people sort of generally take a hostile po posture towards nuclear, which is curious because it's um, it's clean energy. But um, but but I mean, the the, the demands in the West, uh, the, the data center energy demands are mm. are, are are driving things like uh, the reopening of Three Mile Island and uh, discussions of not the huge nuclear power plants, but uh, uh, thanks to technology, some of the smaller uh, nuclear power centers that can be uh, stood up. So what your view on that? Exactly. Exactly, Dan. So so again, fundamentally, there's two points. One is we should not shut down nuclear power plants that are already running. They've basically been paid for. We've already committed to decommissioning at, the, at some point. Right now, they're producing almost free, uh, as you point out, clean energy. Of course, we should just keep them going. Unfortunately, that's not what has been happening either in New York or in, in California, and certainly not, for instance, in Germany, where they've shut down all of their nuclear power plants and basically replaced it all with coal and gas. That's a dumb idea in any sense of the word. Now, building new power plants turns out to be a lot more costly, and that's why we really should be focusing on what you just talked about, those small modular nuclear power plants that we're thinking about will be the fourth generation that could potentially be much, much cheaper because they can be produced essentially like Ford did with the uh, Ford T. You know, we just produce lots of them, uh, and it will be become very cheap for each one of them. Each one of them will perhaps uh, take up as much space as a as a shipping container and could basically power a whole neighborhood. That kind of thing would be incredibly uh, ideal. We should definitely look into it. Again, this is future, so you know we should always be a little aware that people are trying to oversell it, but this could be one of the solutions where we could get lots of cheap power that was also incredibly clean. It just seems to me that you have this uh, this bulwark against uh, common sense and and really um, uh, trying to find innovation and solutions that the 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 individuals were talking about, the Camilla Thorndikes of the world. I mean, they're just ideologues. Yeah. They they want to ban fossil fuels and they want to do it as quickly as possible, uh, regardless of the consequences. Oh, God, yes. I mean, we if, if you're incredibly worried and look, this is not unrealistic that you are. If you read sort of mainstream media, the feeling is that the world is really about to falter because of climate change. Of course, most of those stories are just simply wrong. Uh, you know, remember how you heard about how all the polar bears would right. die okay. out? Well, actually, the truth is that we've never had more polar bears since the 1950s, mostly because we stopped shooting them. And that's a really good idea. But this is not, you know, this is not <laughs> rocket science. You need to tell your kids, fundamentally, the world is pretty good. There are problems, yes, and we should fix them, but this is not the end of the world. Well, and, and so I, I live I live in the southern Sweden near Denmark, and one of our Danish um, uh, m uh, meteorologists just you know, suggests, because he was so worried about climate, that we should literally go back to the uh, lockdowns of COVID. And I'm like, well, what planet are you worried? I get that you're worried. But this is not going to work. And, of course, you're never going to get people to vote for that kind of uh, craziness. Well, Beyond Lomberg, I have to tell you, the same thing happened during COVID. I had a, a 
was at a chiropractor and she said, well, this is just, you know, a dress rehearsal for the, you know, climate lockdowns that we're going to be doing later on in life. But um, you debunked the polar bear, which was the emblem of climate apocalypse back in, what, 2006? Then they moved on to the uh, Great Barrier Reef. How is that faring? So, again, the point is the Great Barrier Reef, do they, since 1986, they've actually done official surveys of the Great Barrier Reef, how much coral is there. And the last three years, they've never seen more coral in their measurements. It's doing incredibly well. Now, again, there are problems. We have bleaching events, but they have happened all the time. Uh, and they've been happening certainly for the last uh, uh, eight years. There's been, what, five bleaching episodes. But still, we see the data from 2023, 2024, which is the latest data, being the maximum we've ever seen. So you, we need to know. You hear a lot about this is terrible. This is a catastrophe. The Guardian wrote the obituary of the Great Barrier Reef oh, in right. 2014. But the truth is, it's never been better. Uh, we're just coming out of hurricane season and hardly unscathed, as you well know, in uh, Florida and North Carolina, mm -hmm. Georgia, Tennessee. Um, and uh, CBS News had a report last week about how Chicago could soon be experiencing a more severe hurricane season, Chicago, because of climate change. So I, I just wanted a, a little bit of a refresher for people from you mm. on, on hurricanes over time and what we know. So fundamentally, uh, the, we can't see the signal in data. Even uh, NASA is telling us we cannot see a climate signal in the data. Uh, we expect in the future that there will be fewer hurricanes, which is better, but they will be slightly stronger, which will be worse. So there is a problem in the long run future, but it's a much, much more problem than what most people talk about. Of course, the vast majority of the problem that we see both in Florida and everywhere else is the fact that we have many more people living, for instance, in coastal areas with much more stuff. They're just much richer. That's why we see more problems. That's why we see more billion dollar damages, not because of climate, but because of social impacts. Just remember, uh, from uh, 1900, the U.S. has increased its population by a little over four times. Uh, but the Florida coastal counties have increased 67 times. Not surprisingly, when you have a lot more people with much more stuff, you get more damages. We should be careful about that. We should make sure that people, for instance, have better building regulations. But fundamentally, this is not a problem that's going to be a huge game changer. I wanted to get your temperature uh, on um, green energy subsidies, too. I, this is a bit in a in an, a little ironic twist, which is uh, fun, except I don't like the underlying policy. Elon Musk yesterday, Tesla had, I think, its second best day in the market ever. He became billions of dollars richer after a strong earnings report from Tesla, uh, $2.2 .2 billion in profit, which is a 70% increase from a year earlier. However, it's green energy subsidies that are driving that profitability. Mm -hmm. Auto sales increased by 1% while regulatory credits grew 33 uh, percent. The credits, regulatory credits accounted for a third of Tesla's profit. And so, like, you know, I like Elon Musk and all, but um, I'm not really interested. I don't like oil. I don't like subsidies for the oil and gas industry, and I don't like subsidies for green energy either. There's a competitive marketplace, but that means everybody competes on an equal a playing ground rather than, you know, the government largesse for selected favored industries or sectors. What, 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 I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm all for innovation, but not with driven by industrial, the you know, politicians, industrial policy. And I wanted to get your take on that. Yeah. I mean, look, politicians for uh, at least five, 10 years have decided we should all switch to electric cars. Uh, but the problem is that most people don't seem to agree. Uh, you know, when you ask most American yeah. uh, people, they want uh, their next car to be a gasoline or a diesel driven car as well. And not surprising because then you can actually, you know, get a filler up and and just a couple of minutes instead of having to wait for 40 minutes and and actually have an access to a uh, a charger. And of course, there's a whole problem of what are you going to do if you don't live in a house, which a lot of people don't do. If you live in cities, where are you going to charge your car? There are all these kinds of problems. Well, I'm again, I, I totally agree with you. I'm all for innovation. Once the electric car becomes a better car 
than gasoline driven cars. You don't need to mandate them. You don't need to subsidize them, which is really bribing people. And you don't need to outlaw gasoline cars. People will just simply switch. We're not seeing that in most of the world. We are actually seeing a lot in China um, because, as we know, China can actually mandate what people do uh, and they want to move away from being dependent on oil and instead be able to have all their cars run on electricity, which in many cases will be powered by coal. I get that. That probably is smart from, for, for China. But fundamentally, most people don't want electric cars. Let's move to the day when people want electric cars because of innovation. That would be great. But we should not be spending tons of money cutting a tiny bit of CO2 emissions for a very, very large subsidy. That's just dumb. Bjorn Lumberg, president of the Copenhagen Consensus Think Tank, author of Best Things First. Bjorn, thank you as always. Great to talk to you guys. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. Connect with Dan and Amy using the AM560 mobile app. Download it today at 560theanswer.com slash mobile. Have you heard about this guy, Donald Rainwater? I sure have. Guy was a deadbeat dad. Total loser. Not only did Rainwater repeatedly fail to pay his child support, he filed for bankruptcy and had his car repossessed. But what did a court find he spent the money on? Cigarettes. Hasn't he run for office twice before and lost each time? Sure has. Maybe that's why he wants the job, so taxpayers pay off all his debt.